Welcome to Wellness Spring, your oasis of health and vitality. Today, we have the privilege of hosting Dr. Ron Ehrlich, a true visionary in the realm of holistic health. Join us as Dr. Ron uncovers the pivotal role of public health messages and industry influence, including food and pharmaceuticals in shaping our healthcare landscape. Together, we will explore the challenges factors pose to maintaining holistic health and discover actionable steps individuals and organizations can take to navigate these complexities with resilience and clarity. Welcome, Ron, to Wellness Spring. It is so lovely to have you on the show. Beverly, thank you so much for having me. I, I'm just blown away when I read all your bio and everything else because we have so much in common with health and wellness and nutrition and regenerative farming and the list goes on um so could you please um share with us how your journey into holistic health began and what some early influences from your upbringing family and surroundings that shaped your approach to health and wellness yeah, well, very early on, I mean, I've, I graduated from dental school 45 years ago uh, at a very, very young age, I should say. And uh, I I very quickly, very surprisingly got into dealing with chronic musculoskeletal pain. I thought I'd be in dental pain area of toothaches <laughs> and stuff, but I rather surprisingly found myself also having an impact on a few patients with their headaches, their tension, normal tension headaches. And that led me to a period of about two or three years of exploring um, what was going on, what the connection was between jaw clenching and chronic pain. And in 1983, it led me to a model of healthcare that I've pursued ever since. And that model basically was the five stressor model that I've used professionally and personally and have written about in my book. Um, and that is to say, uh, stress uh, is the what what how you define stress is anything that compromises your immune system or promotes chronic inflammation, and so I define five stressors: emotional, environmental, postural, nutritional, and dental stress, and that's led me into an interest in each of those five areas. Obviously, my focus clinically, professionally, at the coalface, if you like was dental. So that set me on a journey of discovery where I realized this wasn't just a model for treating people with chronic musculoskeletal pain, but also a good model for treating people with any health condition or um, trying to keep healthy. So I've kind of then morphed into a model where it's I see life as a balancing beam and on one side of the beam, it's to identify and minimize as many of those five stressors as possible. And on the other side of the balancing beam is to build resilience by focusing on five pillars of health, sleep, breathe, nourish, move, and think. And the balancing beam, if you like, pivots on our genes and how our genes express themselves, the wonderful an empowering science of epigenetics. We are not a victim to our genes. So that's been my professional journey. And well, you probably realize this yourself that the more you learn about health, the more you realize you don't know. And I find that rather exciting and uh, empowering. Influences on my life have been, well, there was a chiropractor, uh, Dr. George Goodhart, who gave me that model in 1983 in a pro in a in a workshop I did in America, um, that five stressor model. Um, Dr. Janet Travell, who is a, a, a physician who used to be President Kennedy and President Johnson's doctor in the White House. I spent some time with her. Uh, she, she, I did a workshop with her for a, about a week in 1989 when she was 92 years old. And she said, if you listen to your patients, they'll often, and you ask them the right questions, and you listen with an open mind, then often they'll not only tell you 
what's wrong with them, but they'll often tell you how to fix it. And then um, also, you know, another great influence has been um, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who, who's talked about um, the, the, the epigenetics, the biology of belief. And if thoughts are things called neurotransmitters that can attach onto cell membranes and cause themselves to express themselves in some way, then so can nutrients and so can toxins. So he was another great influence. And then the world of regenerative agriculture and holistic land management via Alan Savory and um, others have been a great source of uh, inspiration to me over the years. Wow, you covered a lot then. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of Dr. Bruce Lipton and um, um, pre-COVID, I was arranging to have him Nassim Haramein and Dr. Joan, a few others come for a conference in Monaco because I used to organize holistic conference. And you mentioned his book, The Biology of Belief. And it's incredible, you know, as you said, the more you delve into it, the more you find out. And you mentioned some amazing um, people as well. And um, what about your family though? Because I know you co-founded your Sydney Holistic Healthcare Dental Practice and um, your brother's yes. there, now your nephew. Yes. How did that well, start? Well, well, that started uh, with uh, my brother and I were in separate practices in the city up until about 1981. Uh, he was across the road from me and we were in tiny little practices. And when I got involved in this pain, pro, you know, pain treatment, uh, we decided to merge our practices together and in 1983 um, began a journey on the holistic dental uh, front, uh, firstly exploring the controversial issues of dental mercury amalgam. I was uh, I had graduated from Sydney University and um, I also believed, like every graduate in dental school, that mercury was locked into the fillings and it was perfectly safe and there was no problem. And uh, uh, several practitioners that weren't dentists were encouraging me to look beyond the dental literature. And so we then in 1983 or four stopped using dental amalgam. So I've been very lucky. My brother has been a great source of support for me. I always felt that if I could talk my brother, my brother is a lot more conservative in his approach and uh, I always felt that if I could convince him of something professionally, then it was probably a good idea. And uh, to his credit, and perhaps mine, I could convince him probably 90% of the time. Um, then I had, then about 30 years ago, we were joined by Dr. Craig Wilson, who just was the perfect balance between uh, Josh and myself. Um, and he also contributed greatly to that process. Then about 15 or so years ago, Dr. Yin Teo joined the practice and brought a, a whole new level of skills. And 10 years ago, we were really excited to have Josh's son, my nephew, who is like a son to me, Dr. Lewis Ehrlich, join us. And quite frankly, um, they, they have taken it to another level. And I'm really proud of where particularly uh, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Craig and uh, Dr. Yin Yin Teo have taken the practice. Uh, so yeah, they've been huge supports and huge influences on me. And I'm really, I've been a very, very lucky person in my life, my family, be it my parents, my brother, my wife, my children, and more recently, my grandchildren have been a tremendous mm. source of support and inspiration to me. So I've, I'm a very, very fortunate person. I, I, I'm i aware of the power of gratitude and I express it regularly and and uh, and I passionately as well. That's wonderful. And I've experienced um, treatment with your lovely nephew, Lewis, and also Emily, the dental hygienist. And mm. for the listeners, I can highly recommend the whole experience because the staff are so welcoming. They're all highly professional and just the holistic approach, you know, asking you so many questions about your background, your lifestyle and so forth. And for the listeners, Dr. Ron actually inspired me when I listened to him at a chat about 30 odd years ago 
uh, in um, North Sydney with Sandy Spears and the Holistic Business Centre, and you mentioned about the amalgam. And growing up in Wales, in the UK, um, my mouth, they said, oh, your enamel's not good. And my mouth was just full of amalgam fillings of all sizes. And mm. I was very faithful to my dentist at the time, so I went to him to have them all taken out. Can you tell us more? Because I know you're passionate about amalgam and the harmful effects of it. Mm. Yeah, it's such an interesting one. And honestly, when I graduated, I just believed it was locked in and it was harmless. And if any did escape, it was the harmless, in inverted commas, inorganic form of mercury. Uh, and I didn't want to believe it. So about, as I said, in 1983, I was put, I was encouraged to read beyond the dental journals into environmental journals and other journals in science. And I had had three samples of, of mercury fillings that I'd removed from a patient. And I knew from their records that they were five, seven, 10 years old. And when they went in, there was 50% mercury and the other 50% is silver, tin, zinc and copper. So when I sent them off for analysis, they came back and some were 37%, some were 40, 42%. So mercury had escaped. Then the next question is, um, how significant is that? Uh, and of course, the answer is, no, no, it's okay, it does escape, they'll admit that now, but it's the inorganic form. Well, the problem with the inorganic form is that if it comes into contact with microbes, of which there are a few in the mouth and the gut, uh, then uh, it goes through a methylation process which converts inorganic mercury into organic mercury and that organic mercury can displace sulfidal, sulfhydryl groups from important compounds in the body like enzymes, uh, hormones, DNA, um, a whole range of things. So I think possibly the most telling um, thing about dental mercury amalgam is, and this is what you can always ask your dentist who may dismiss this, you can say, okay, you think it's safe. When you have a little bit left over, you haven't that you've used on you know there's a, you've used some on me but there's a little bit left over what do you do with the little bit that's left over the scrap because i know the answer to that question it is illegal by law for a dentist to dispose of dental mercury amalgam into the garbage the toilet or down the sink that is illegal but according to the nh and mrc and the ada and the and the health authorities the only safe place to store this toxic material is in the human body. And if that makes sense to you, then you've got a bit of an insight into some of the other public health messages that may not be, that may not have our health as their highest priority. So I think the dental mercury one was a really interesting one. We always had a position that there were two issues. One, should we still be using the material? In our opinion, the answer was definitely no. It should have been withdrawn in the mid 80s um, and it is slowly happening, but we are in 2024 now. So do we use the material? No, and we stopped using it in about 1985. The second issue is should everybody have every amalgam out? And my answer to that is no, you should proceed very cautiously because you can be exposed to a lot of mercury if the filling is removed carelessly without adequate protection to you and the dentist. And you also need to be careful in disrupting the tooth and, and irritating the tooth unnecessarily. So this, this is a really complex issue. I mean, one of the things I'm really proud of at the Sydney Holistic Dental Centre is that we are a patient-centred practice. And people often go, well, well what does that mean? And, and I mean, it's obvious. But what are the alternatives? Well, you could be a symptom-based practice, which means you just fix things that go wrong. You could be a practitioner-centered practice, and we've all been to those. A lot of dent a lot of medical specialists live in a practitioner-centered practice where we are so honored to be in their presence. We should just be grateful to be listening to the wisdom of this practitioner. That's a practitioner-centered practice. And a financial centered practice is one where, you know, there's, they're trying to, in, to uh, generate as much um, fees as possible. And there's nothing wrong with 
you know, being paid properly in a, in a profession. I'm not saying that. But if that's the driving force for how you interact with patients, I think that's a real serious problem. We always had a very simple uh, rule, and that was if my wife, my daughter, my mother was sitting in the chair, what would I say to them knowing what I know? And that is a patient-centered approach. Wow, that's amazing. And I wish all dentists were the same as you and all professions, because I think what you covered there is, you know, so important to every aspect of life, whatever business you're in, whatever tradesperson or health profession you're with. And you mentioned the role of um, public health messages as well as the, you know, and I know you're passionate about the influence of the industries like food and pharmaceuticals in shaping our healthcare system. How do these factors contribute to the challenges we face in maintaining holistic health? And what steps can individuals and organizations take to na navigate these complexities? What a great question and, you know, Look, I think um, public, well, we live in a world of evidence-based medicine, right? I mean, that's what we're told all the time. Everything yeah. has to be evidence-based. Well, let's look at the evidence because over the last 40 years, we have a an epidemic of preventable chronic degenerative diseases that have been getting worse. Diabetes has gone through the roof. Cardiovascular disease is still the number one killer in globally. Cancer number two. Prescription medication taken as prescribed is the third biggest killer in our society. Autoimmune conditions. 30 years ago, there were 60. That is the body attacking itself. Um, now there are over 100. Um, mental health, one in four uh, Australians have a mental health problem. One in six are on antidepressants. So if the evidence is anything to go by, and we are reminded that it should all be evidence-based, then you would have to say that there has been a serious public health problem. And that serious public health problem has, I believe, come about largely because since 1980, since a deregulated market, a market-driven economy, where shareholder supremacy trumps everything, and I use that word advice, you know, purposefully, yeah. where, where a shareholder supremacy trumps everything, including public health, then the role of the chemical, food, and pharmaceutical industry, and to that I would now add the media industries. I don't like to call them news services. I don't believe we have many news services anymore. We have many media outlets and we call them newspapers, uh, we call them uh, news stations, but essentially they are media outlets. Th this, is, this is what is influencing public health policy. So this is, um, you know, good health, good health may make sense, but it doesn't make dollars. And when you have an industry like the pharmaceutical industry, which is now uh, valued at, it has revenue of, US $1.5 trillion a year, that's US $1.5 trillion a year, that's something like almost uh, 2.5 or 2.7 trillion Australian dollars a year, the pharmaceutical industry, that doesn't happen if there is good health in the community. So paradoxically, our healthcare system is actually a chronic disease management system and uh, not really well focused on public health. And I think part of the problem is that there is a huge, there are two words, if, I, if you like, that I think summarise why we have this problem. One is ignorance and the other is overwhelm. And, um, you know, I, I know lots of doctors who work in practices where they have a 10 or 15 minute appointment and a prescription will result. I know a lot of integrative doctors who spend an hour or, or more with their patients, whatever. And I know both of them have one thing in common, they want the best for their patients. But, but, but the problem is there is such overwhelm of ill health and a bombardment of supposedly evidence-based medicine, but as one of the most cited academics in healthcare or in medicine, in science globally, 
John Ioannidis from Stanford University, he's, he's been cited about 200,000 times in his articles, says evidence-based medicine is dead. What we have is evidence-based marketing. I think this is a story because of overwhelm that is very easy to miss as a health practitioner, as a patient, but once you hear it, it's very difficult to ignore. And so I think this is part of the problem we find ourselves in today. I totally agree with you. And I'm horrified at all the misconceptions, the confusions and the way people um, have been misled by the marketing. Like you say, we're run by the economy and it's all about um how much money's in it and who's who's behind the money. And in your book, you give some great examples about Pepsi, for example, and the the do you want to explain about that how pep sugar was <laughs> advertised as being poison and then next year it's not? Yeah, well that that is a whole story about some of the big public health messages that we hear that um like, for example, the demonization of fat. Fat makes you fat. Well, that rolls off the tongue very easily, and it seems to make sense if you didn't think about it. Um, but it's part, but since we have demonized fat, uh, obesity has gone through the roof, and so has diabetes. So, you know, the demonization of fat meant that we ended up with a whole lot more sugar or versions of sugar. There are many different versions of sugar in our, in our foods. And when you look at the sponsors of some of the biggest uh, uh, professional organizations in the world, um, you know, it is really alarming. I mean, it, the names that keep coming up sponsoring the American Dietitians Association or the Australian uh, dietitians associations of people like Nestle, Campbell's Food, Unilever, the makers of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and flora margarine, or it could be the Grains and Legumes Council or the Dairy Council. Um, so, so, you know, there's a huge amount of corporate support for, for getting out public health messages for the good of, leave that word blank, um, is it for the mm. shareholder or is it for the public? Well, these companies have a fiduciary duty to provide good returns for their shareholders. So the one thing, and the same is true of pharmaceutical industry. I mean, the ultimate goal in the pharmaceutical industry, and, and we've probably just lived through the greatest business model in human history, uh, the COVID pandemic, um, the, the, the best business model is to identify to diagnose as many people in the population as possible as having an illness, which then needs to be managed, preferably for a lifetime. And that is a great economic model. It's just not a very good health model. The problem is that, um, well, you know, th there is a conflict of interest. And so where do we go from there as, a, as the public? I think we do have to come back to basics you know, we do have to come back to a common understanding of what got us to where we are in an evolutionary sense. You know, when mm. we parted, when we parted with the chimps and gorillas six million years ago, our brains were about 400 cc in size. Then Homo erectus came along and it was about 700 or 1,000 cc's. And by the time we got to Homo sapiens, we were about 14 or 1500 cc. So the question is, how did our brains grow? And the answer is, we learnt to harness fire. We learnt to cook meats and extract nutrients, which provided us with the basis for our brains to grow. And that had a significant impact on our journey. So, you know, that's one thing. Did we have lots of sugar? Well, if we found a, a tree with honey, you know, with a, with a beehive in it, my God, we would gorge ourselves. Of course we would, but we wouldn't have access to that 24 seven all year round. So, so you know, we just need to go back and think about how did we evolve? 
and and listen thank god we live in you know with the safety net of modern medicine i don't want to um you know <laughs> trivialize that i've been the recipient of that and it's had a huge impact on my life it saved my it saved members of my family's lives so i am eternally grateful to modern medicine for the miracles of modern medicine but it's the way we approach health and and preventable chronic diseases which is where the problem really lies. So, you know, I think we need to be aware of that. I think that's a story that's easy to miss, but difficult to ignore once you hear it. I think ignorance, Beverly, ignorance is a wonderful thing. I practice it regularly. I practice ignorance regularly. It's why I have my own podcast. Every week I get to ask people who know much more than I do questions and, and they answer them. And, and I learn a lot from it. Um, and so that's great. But if you combine ignorance with ego, arrogance and hubris, and even worse, if that ego then informs public health policy, then we have, based on the evidence we have available to us today, an epidemic in preventable diseases. Yes. Oh, my God, it's so scary. And it's horrendous and I think because we live in a fast-paced world people have become um, masters at being busy and they don't have time to sit down and think and when I was growing up you know in my era we seen doctors as gods and as Bruce Lipton would say if you're sick and you go to the doctors 90 percent of your illness has disappeared you've healed yourself by the time you get to the doctors, they're so rapid, you know, you think they're going to heal you, so they do. And now um, people, you know, I've recently, and I totally agree with you about modern medicine being a wonderful thing, and we need it for baseline um, tests and evidence. And then it's up to you how you move forward, but it's good um, to have informed choices. And I was horrified when I went to the doctors recently to get, you know, basic checks. And um, I asked for um, a vitamin D test and they said, well, things have changed in Australia now. And if you've had one, you can only have one in your lifetime here for free. Otherwise it's $400. And I went, what? That's crazy. Because having lived in France for 15 years, we used to get free twice a year tests because Vitamin D is a hormone, as you know, and so important for so many areas of our life, like our brain and, and you know, every system in our body probably is affected by vitamin D. And he just said to me, um, well, it's not that bad. He said, you have your test. If it's low, you take two tablets for life. And if it's normal, you just take one. And I said to him, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that, you know. I believe, you know, sometimes you need supplements and other times you don't and you need to monitor it. Mm. So, you know, well, and as you say, carry on. I was going to well, say well, in your... Go on. I was going to say in your book, you mention about doctors are overworked, overwhelmed, and they just accept whatever prescriptions take this, this is the wonder drug, and it's all sounds amazing, or oh, we've got this new disease, high cholesterol, this, that, or the other, and they just take it and prescribe it. Yes, well, that's what I mean about ignorance combined mm. with ego and arrogance and hubris, because, yeah. you know, I think I, I totally get the fact that if you're, you know, as a doctor, you want certainty, because people are coming in with their health problems and you want to be as certain as you can. Um, so that's that's fine. I, I totally get that. Um, and I believe that doctors should be curious and sceptical. I totally get that too. My challenge to doctors is this. At what point in your medical education does that scepticism and curiosity kick in? Does it kick in after third year medicine where you started to study pharmacology and pathology and learnt how beautifully it was to be able to identify a disease and have a surgery or a pharmaceutical to treat that disease? Or should your curiosity go back maybe a year or two earlier than that to biochemistry, physiology, and learn 
why that disease actually occurred in the first place and learn how to restore the body's natural ability to heal itself. Um, you know, so this is very much about ignorance, ego, arrogance, and hubris. And I totally get why there should be curiosity, there should be skepticism and curiosity. But unfortunately, uh, too many in the medical profession are skeptical of the basics, like biochemistry mm. and, and vitamin D is a classic example. If you go through the, the, bi the biochemical pathways we all learnt in first or second year dental school, medical school or whatever, you know, we know that vitamin D is critically important. And here's another public health message that has caused far more problems that it's, than it's fixed, and that is to stay out of the sun. Not only did we demonise fats, not only did we demonise saturated animal fats that we've had a relationship with for millions of years and that happen to make up most of our cell membranes and our brain, somehow we've demonised that, we've demonised cholesterol, which is essential for every hormone that regulates us in the body, we've demonised that, but we've also demonised sunshine, which is the greatest source of vitamin D there is. Um, with all sorts of other health, health benefits, about being out in nature, about connecting with nature, physiologically, biochemically, you know, psychologically, so many benefits to being out in the sun. But I go down to the beach, I go down with my grandchildren, and thankfully, we haven't bought in, we haven't swallowed, is it the red pill or the yellow or the blue pill from the matrix? Um, I don't know. I've always get those two confused. But anyway, I, I see young people, young children there with rash tops from head to toe, covered in a hat with zinc cream plastered all over them. And I'm really pleased to see my young grandchildren running around almost naked and bathing in the sunshine, not in the middle of the day, not getting sunburnt, but early in the morning, lots of sunshine, lots of vitamin D, lots of connecting with the earth and nature, lots of good health to follow. So, you know, there's another example of ignorance. You know, yeah. the government congratulated itself for saving $150 million a year by scrapping vitamin D um, testing and in the process probably added a billion or two dollars onto their health budget because of the problems. You know, we talk about ICU, in intensive care units. There was a great study out of the uh, Journal of Immunology, which showed that 70% of people who are admitted to ICU are deficient in vitamin D. And it is a pandemic around the world. Vitamin D deficiency is pandemic. And as you rightly pointed out, Beverly, essential for every aspect of health and anti-cancer, anti-cardiovascular anti disease, anti-mental health, uh, mental health anti all sorts of breast cancer, colon cancer, liver cancer. There might be an, inf there's certainly an impact on skin cancer, but all cause mortality, do the studies and have a look. Or read yeah, the studies, the studies are being done. Exactly. And, um, you know, it's so important, as you said, to be in nature and connect and have fun, just be free. You know, it's absolutely crazy. Yeah, when you were talking about the zinc, it took me back to my sailing days where we'd be plastered in bright zinc coloured and so forth. Anyway, I really want to ask you about, go back to a bit of dentist work. What sure. is the significance of oral diseases and why is it is the black hole of healthcare? <laughs> well, it is, it's interesting because... <laughs> That's a, that's, a, that's another great question, Beverly. Thank you for asking that. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, it's so interesting. Um, World Health Organization, which I have to have some problems with, but they recently did a, a global oral health report. And um, I should preface this by saying that the common denominator in all diseases, physical, mental, and physical and mental disease is chronic inflammation, right? So let's yeah. just park park that aside for a moment. So they did a study on oral health in, in the global setting, and they looked at malignant cancers, for example. Apparently, there are about 100 million malignant cancer cases in the world globally. They looked at uh, diabetes, about 450 million 
cases of diabetes globally. Cardiovascular disease, the biggest killer, 550 million people globally with cardiovascular disease. Uh, mental health, we hear a lot about mental health. And, you know, as I think I said, one in four Australians have a mental health problem. One in six are on antidepressants. There are 1 billion people, just under 1 billion people diagnosed with mental illness globally. Now, when we get to oral diseases, they estimate 3.5 billion people globally have oral diseases. And the most common source of chronic inflammation, remember, uh, that is, mm -hmm. we're talking here about tooth decay and gum disease, yeah. which leads to chronic inflammation, which in turn impacts on every other disease. And I would estimate that 3.5 billion people is a gross underestimation because half the population don't go to the dentist every, you know, some half the population haven't been to the dentist in the last two years. So, so three and a half billion people would be a underestimation. And the other important thing to remember about oral diseases, tooth decay and gum disease, and this still blows me away after 45 years of clinical practice, the vast majority of oral diseases have no pain associated with them. So we had a patient in recently who came in with stage four cancer and the, the doctor who referred them quite rightly for a comprehensive oral exam, which I think is a really important thing, a comprehensive oral exam, um, was concerned about a tooth that had a root canal treatment in it. And, and when we did a 3D, cone, a 3D scan and, and looked at every tooth and every, every, every which way that you could, it turned out that on the right-hand side of her mouth, the root canal was on one side. It looked fine clinically. We could talk a lot about that. But the other side of the mouth had advanced periodontal and infection and, and tooth infection at the tip of the root that must have been there for at least five or six years. She'd been diagnosed with stage four cancer three or four years earlier. And I said to her, was this tooth, was this side of the mouth ever painful? And she said, no, not really. Sometimes when I bite, it's a little bit tender, but it's never been a problem. And when we took a, a 3D x-ray, the bone, there was almost complete bone loss around one tooth and infection around two or three others that had at least been there for the last five or six years. So, you know, there is a case of somebody that's gone through a huge amount of treatment and diagnosis through some of the top people in, in Australia, no doubt, but ideally should have had a comprehensive oral exam to eliminate the most common disease known to man, woman, or child, and that is tooth decay and gum disease with implications on every other disease because of the link of chronic inflammation. Yeah, I know. Um, <clears throat> I've been back and forth dentists all my life with crowded teeth, impacted teeth, overlapping teeth. And because you're a breathing instructor as well, I did some training with Patrick McEwen from the Boteco method, and he's, you know, the authority on nasal breathing. And we've been through a pandemic where everybody could have learned to functionally breathe because as you breathe, then it stimulates the nitric ox oxygen, sterilize your air and so forth. And when you're mouth breathing, you're breathing in all the gunk and that can add to, you know, infections as well. But my mum had um, periodontal disease and ha she chose to have all her teeth out and then she had leukemia. And I actually got diagnosed 16 years ago with uh, thyroid and ovary cancer, but I healed it myself. But I've had for 20 years um, gum disease on and off, but my gums are shrinking. So just listening to you talking because I've been fanatical about cleaning my teeth and seeing dentists every six months. And, you know, it's very hard. Mm. And then you see other people. And I know lots of people that don't even bother going to the dentist. And yeah, um, yeah I think people ignore the fact. And it's like, well, when they come to see me, you've got all these other diseases. Don't you go to the dentist? You know, this is where it starts, yeah. you know? 
Well, this is why I do refer to the oral cavity as the black hole of healthcare. And, yeah. you know, I know, I know <laughs> it's an obvious one, but, but here's why. I mean, doctors and uh, health practitioners, allied health practitioners, will do their oral health assessment on their patient. Well, they may do nothing at all. They may not mm. even ask them a question. But the one question they might ask them is, have you been to the dentist lately? And they will say yes or no. And if they've said yes, the doctor or practitioner will say, did anything show up? And the patient will say no. And thereby, the doctor has done an oral health assessment through those two or three questions. Remember, 95% mm. of oral diseases have no pain associated with them. So that's the dent that's the medical profession, um, how they approach it. The dental mm. profession, look, dentistry is such an intense profession, and we are focused on minutia. And what I mean by that is the human hair is 50 to 70 microns thick, right? Use that as a reference point. The human hair is 50 to 70 microns thick. A dentist assess the join between a filling and a tooth or between a crown and a tooth on the basis of about 20 microns. So if the gap between the filling and the tooth or the crown and the tooth is more than 20 microns, then you have got leakage in that filling and more than likely decay will start to percolate underneath it. So we are, and, and also we're dealing with a very stressful situation. We're dealing with the person's most sensitive part of the body, the mouth, while they're awake, while they're trying to breathe and swallow, um, you know, doing dental work that requires incredible technique sensitivity and trying to stay calm through it all. So it's really easy for dentists to get so focused on what they do that it's easy to forget that the, there's a mouth attached, there's a human body attached to the mouth mm. that you're working on. So it's a kind of a black hole there, and we need to take a step back and get into the habit of doing a comprehensive oral exam. I mean, if you're in perfect health, you've never had a filling, you know, you, you're in your 40s or 50s and you're in perfect health and you've got all 32 of your teeth, you've never had a filling, your gums don't bleed when you brush and floss, you, you know, everything's perfect. Hey, good on you. Well done you. That's less of a problem. You know, they're not really the people we're talking about. But unfortunately, not everybody falls into that category. And, um, you know, so we, we do need to take a comprehensive oral exam seriously in healthcare. Agree. And I know in your Unstress podcast, you always ask your guests, what's the greatest challenge to us as individuals on our health journey through life? Could you please tell us your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it, I think we kind of covered it a little bit because I do yeah. think I do think that ignorance is one thing, and and as I said, I'm 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 practicing ignorance regularly, so I'm not holding yeah. myself up to be an authority. But I think there's something about keeping an open mind and remembering how the human body works. Keeping remembering that it's a whole body we're talking about in a whole world, and we're all connected, we're all affected. Um, so that that is really important. Ignorance is one thing, and overwhelm is another. Doctors are overwhelmed. Professionals are overwhelmed, healthcare professionals. We, as the public, because we're all patients as well, everybody is constantly overwhelmed, you know, and there's something about distracting us from the simple things. I mean, I a, a very frequent thing that I like to remind people of is that as the world we live in becomes increasingly more complicated, the solutions to staying healthy are remarkably simple cheap, accessible, sustainable, and most importantly, effective. So I think keeping it simple, keeping an open mind, and keeping in touch with what we have with nature with our, with, and with our journey through time, I think they're really the biggest challenges we have. Right. And 
You've mentioned a couple of times now your five pillars of health and wellness. Do you want to go into that a bit more? Sure. Well, look, um, as I said, the balancing beam of five stressors, emotional, environmental, postural, nutritional and dental stress that promote chronic inflammation and, and reduce immune function. But the five pillars are sleep, breathe, nourish, move and think. And I would say you've already mentioned the importance of breathing. Um, you know, I mean, this is not a, a I'm not giving too much away here, Beverly. The secret to living a long life is to keep breathing for as long as you can. Um, but <laughs> there is a <laughs> there is a big difference between just breathing and staying alive and breathing well and being healthy. So there is a big difference between just breathing, and you mentioned mouth, mouth breathing and nasal breathing, big difference there. Um, you know, so breathing and sleeping are foundational. Um, nourish, you know, nourish is a whole story on its own. But I think if we look into an ancestral diet, we get a pretty good idea of what we should be eating. Movement, I say movement rather than join a gym and do workouts. We just need to get out and move and move regularly and think, you know, the, while we may not have control over events or people in our lives, what we do have control about is how we think about it. And, and I have been really focusing in these last two years, particularly on mindset. My, my focus is very much on looking at our daily challenges, personal and professional, the mindset with which we approach those challenges. Is it a growth mindset or is it a threat survive mindset? That's important. And how do we recover each and every day? And that's where the five pillars come in. So that's kind of the model that I would work on. But those five pillars, sleep, breathe, foundational, nourish, move and think, absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. I am. And um, yeah, you also run workshop, workplace programs. And I know during the pandemic, two of my nieces, one of them was studying to be a teacher, or she was at the time. And when she had to do placements, there was such a high number of teachers off sick. And she's still experiencing that now she's qualified. Um, she goes to schools and there's so many off sick. And the other one was um, just 25 and she was working for a branding and marketing multi-dollar company. And her manager was taking a full day off on a Friday while the rest were doing 80 plus hours a week she had no no support and she was like pushed up the ladder with nothing fortunately she's left that job now because there was no support but um can you tell us a bit about your workshop program and um for mainly how it focuses on transforming the collective health of teams and organizations and maybe some insights that you could share on how individual health within a workplace setting can lead to a broader positive impact. Yeah, well, I, having been in healthcare for all this time, what I've come to realise is it's a paradox. And the paradox is um, good health, as I've said, may make sense, but it doesn't make dollars. So while the healthcare system we have is a great economic model, it's not a very good health model. What's changed not just in my professional life, but in the legislation, is in October 2022 in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, and internationally through an international, an ISO standard, ISO 45003, psychosocial risk, safety and risk in the workplace is now legislated. It is the responsibility of not only boards, not only CEOs, not only heads of HR or people and culture, and not only managers, it is to manage and mitigate, minimise psychosocial risk and encourage well-being for their workforce. So that's now not just a nice to have, it's a must have. And there are literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of fines being issued. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So workplace well-being is where I believe we will see change globally in healthcare. Why? Because there is a confluence of interest. Deloitte did a study 
In October, in 2023, Deloitte's UK did a study which showed for every one pound or dollar a company spends on well-being, there is a five dollar or five pound sixty return. So, unlike in healthcare, where good health may make sense but it doesn't make dollars, in the workplace, not only does good health make sense, but it also makes dollars. And Burnout and stress is a major problem in the workplace. And if you think it's just the workplace, get this. I did a podcast recently on, on medical burnout. 44% of doctors and 60% of nurses in Australia suffer from burnout. So that's a sobering statistic. So, so I think the, where we should be focusing on is the workplace and the way to reduce stress in the workplace is to be have an engaged workforce. And how do we have an engaged workforce? We have an engaged workforce by people having regular, me, that means weekly, meaningful conversations with their team. And that, that doesn't just mean at the water cooler, oh, how was your weekend? Oh, yeah, great. Will I see you this? No, it's to sit down only for five or 10 minutes every week and say, how has your week been? How is it? Have you faced any problems? Do you have any suggestions for making the workplace better? Thank you for your input. Move on. And, I, and that hmm. level of engagement and involvement can make a big difference. So I think the workplace is a really interesting area to be involved. I'm very excited about focusing on it because there is a confluence of interest and there's a great return on investment. And our focus is on the daily challenges, the mindset and the recovery. And the recovery is embedded in the five stress or five pillar model, but the mindset is focused on positive intelligence, looking at the saboteurs which go on in our brain, sabotaging us every day. It's about giving a language and structure to the voice that goes on in our head each and every day and having our minds work for us instead of against us. Our mind can be our best friend or our worst enemy. Yeah, I I can relate to that as I teach people mindset as well and the disempowering beliefs and our about our egos and so forth. Um, and I've, I'm a former nurse and I know lots of nurses here and doctors, and I can totally um, empathise with them because they're still overworked, overwhelmed, and burn out. Like one friend is at um, the Royal Randwick and she's in charge of drug and alcohol and six of her colleagues are off sick, you know, and she has to cover that hospital and others as a nurse consultant. And the pressure, you're not getting it from the top, you're not getting the support and, you know, and the list goes on. Well, and... there's, a, there's a different, there's, it's. There's a difference between being stressed and being burnt out. The, the, the mm. features of being burnt out are that you are disengaged, that you are that you feel what you're doing is ineffective, and yeah. that you are exhausted. So they're the three. D-I-R, D-I-E. Disengaged, ineffective, mm. and exhausted. Die. Well, hopefully. I like not. that anagram. Mm. Yes. And um I always ask my guests, if there was one thing you could do to change the world, what would that be? I think it would be to encourage us to re-engage locally with our communities. I think the, the irony of modern life is that we are connected with the whole world. We could have literally thousands or even millions of friends on Facebook and on social media but we're not engaged to the person sitting with the person sitting next to us. We don't know who our neighbours are. We should be collectively, we should be coming back into the village. I mean, I think globalisation has some, some great benefits, but I do believe that if we just focused back on putting our feet back on the ground, literally and metaphorically, mm -hmm. and, and connecting with each other and with nature, that would make a huge difference to us as, as, a, as a global population, both for the health of people and the planet, because the two are inseparable. Yeah, that's wonderful. I know um, when we were traveling in Italy, in Genoa, there's the oldest living community, 
because they still have social gatherings and community centers and, you know, ex exactly what you're saying, they have that connection. So I think this was an amazing podcast and I'm sure the listeners will think the same. You've covered so many amazing health tips and stuff that we should be looking out for. And um, for the listeners, you can contact Dr. Ron for coaching and whether it's individually at the work at Dr. Ron Ehrlich, E H R I L E H R L I C L I C H dot com. Or I believe you're only seeing um, in your dental practice um, old clients not taking on any no, new. No, I've but... actually no, I've actually stepped away from the clinical side of things now, and I'm just focusing on the workplace well-being, executive and health coaching. So um, no, but the team, as I said, the the team at the Sydney Holistic Dental Centre have taken it to another level anyway. So uh, yeah. you would be in a very good patient-centred hands there in that practice. Yes, so just reach out to them at shdc.com.au and you can also get Ron's book on his website. And is there anything you'd like to share before we say goodbye? No, I think you've covered it very well. Thank you for having me, Beverly. Thank you for being on the show. You're amazing.